Yes, so we're talking about statins and let's speak to, we're going to have Dr. Asim Malhotra uh, in just a second. Let's check he's all present and correct and standing to attention. Morning, doctor. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Very well. Um, would it be better with statins? That's the question. Ka <laughs> Karen. That's a very good question. Yeah. Karen in Wimbledon. You got in touch with us. Deli I'm delighted to say. Um, so get, tell us your, your, your stance on statins. Um, well, just to sort of prefix this by saying I listened to the doctors in the previous program. I mean, my, my experience is just a personal one looking at my mother and then subsequently my aunt. And um, my mother just gradually became immobilized in her 80s. And naturally, we thought that was to do with arthritis or whatever, but she was really suffering, just couldn't get up from the chair, was really complaining, moving around the house. And um, then we started to look at the side effects of some of the drugs she was taking. She subsequently came off the statins and actually could suddenly move freely. So, you know, that was our experience. And then subsequently, my aunt, who was a similar age and is still alive actually now, is 92, um, she had a very similar experience and couldn't get off the chair, couldn't move around. And... and subsequently came off the statins and is now walking freely again. So when I heard that lady on the, the phone to you this morning, I think from Nottinghamshire, that struck a chord with me because that's been our experience too. Mm. Why were they on statins in the first place? Was it on the recommendation of their GP or GPs? It was, yeah. it was yes. My mother had had a kind of... She hadn't had a heart attack or anything, but she had an arrhythmic heartbeat, so that was why. Right. This, this Lancet review... Uh, is all about giving patients and doctors the confidence in statins as life-saving yeah. medication. Hearing you on the radio now, it's a bit, a bit of a setback. So I'm, I'm yeah. sure... I mean, can I say, I, I have a son who works in a clinical lab at Oxford. Yeah. And, you know, I listen to all of it. And, you know, I'm not sort of taking it as a kind of, you know, this is right and this is no, wrong. No, you're telling but us this, your experience, yeah, which is exactly is what we're... Yeah, absolutely our experience. Yeah. And, and on that basis, for them, as patients... I think they've had a better quality of life. Right, well, stay right there. Um, let's go to, let me see now, Joe in St Albans. I assume I'll be with you. Um, hello, Joe. Yeah, hi, Nicky. How it's you all doing? about, you're fine. It's all about people's experiences, and I'm sure we will be getting people who say they're the best thing since uh, sliced statin, sliced bread. Um, what's, <laughs> your, what's your point? Okay, Nicky, the, 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 the main crux of my point is um, the elephant in the room that's not been discussed in this, in this debate so far, and that is that um, what we're really talking about is people's arteries clogging up. That's what the cause of all these issues are, and, and obviously statin is designed to reduce cholesterol. Now, there's a very eminent doctor, a uh, heart surgeon, uh, Dr. Dwight Lundell, and he, he's published a famous paper. You can go on the Internet and find it. And there are other scientists that have backed him up. And what causes these issues predominantly is scratched arteries, okay? Because um, with, when the arteries are scratched, then the cholesterol sticks. So that's what causes the actual arteries to clog up. Now, there are countries in the world where they have um, very high cholesterol counts and they have very low heart problems and very uh, low clogging of arteries because their arteries aren't scratched. So the question is, why are the arteries not scratched? It's because they have a low sugar in their diet, low refined sugar, and low um, refined um, food intake. That's the, the cause of scratched arteries. So the statin debate, now if you've, if you've already got a high cholesterol and you've got heart problems and you've got clogged arteries, there's probably going to be some benefit to taking statins. I'm not going to argue that point. But the massive elephant in the room that nobody's actually debated so far is what causes the clogging. The clogging is caused not by the high cholesterol, but by the, hot, by, by the highly scratched arteries. Dr. Asim Malhotra, anything in this? No, I think both of your um, callers actually have made, have, have made some very important and valid points. I'll, just, I'll answer the first, respond to the... Um, the second call, this gentleman just now, I mean, he has a point. So interestingly, I think the, the way we've said in medical terms is that we have to shift the paradigm in the understanding of what causes heart disease. It's an, it's an inflammatory condition. It's inflammation that's a major issue. And I actually was involved in research that was published in BMJ Open only a few months ago that showed that um, if you're over 60, the so-called LDL or bad cholesterol is not associated 
with heart disease. And interestingly, the higher your cholesterol, the less likely you are to die. And there's lots of reasons behind that. Now, that doesn't say that cholesterol isn't implicated in heart disease, but our current understanding of it and the way we treat it is flawed and incorrect. So inflammation, absolutely, your, the, the second call is absolutely right. It's an infl- inflammatory condition. And the things that contribute to it more than anything else are things like smoking, stress, um, poor diet. Um, you know, as you know, Nikki, I've been one of the big campaigners on the whole sugar campaign. And um, certainly, according to the evidence I've looked at, con- overconsumption of, of processed food, particularly refined carbohydrates, sugar, make cholesterol more inflammatory. And I've made a documentary film on this as well. Um, and coming back to what your first um, caller said. Karen. About, um, Karen. Karen, what Karen was saying about experience with her relatives is very common. I mean, Nikki, just to give you background, as a practicing cardiologist, I've treated thousands of people in my career with heart disease. I see patients on a daily basis who um, suffer, often suffer side effects of statins. Now, the crucial thing here is, is, you know, what, what are the actual true benefits of statins and what are the real harms? Now, in, in, in most cases, these side effects, which are common and interfere with the quality of life, are reversible, often on stopping the statins. But unfortunately, a lot of people remain on the statin because the doctor tells them, well, if you stop your statin, you could die. And actually, this brings us back to the, the bigger issue here, Nikki, and, and this is, and I'll expand on this, and I think it's an important point. We actually have an epidemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed patients. And four of the major factors I'm going to mention are this. One, we have biased funding of research which basically means research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients, bias reporting in medical journals, bias reporting in the media, and an inability of doctors and patients to understand and communicate health statistics. Now, this review in The Lancet today ticks all those boxes of that epidemic of misinformation. I'll tell you why. It's been conducted by the original trialists who have done most of the studies on statins, which are industry-sponsored, and we know that those studies do not assess side effects properly and that they're also highly selected. Now, just to give you an example, when you do a randomized controlled trial, which is the best quality of evidence in these studies, there are significant numbers of people who in a running period when they're trying to see who's eligible for the trial, experience side effects and they're taken out of the trial before it begins. And they sign, they sign agreements, that doesn't get into the final publication. And the final publication is then a selection of people, many of which have not suffered side effects. So the true reality, in my experience, and according to good quality other data that's out there, okay. is that probably at some point, Nikki, at some point, um, up to one in five patients, it may be more, will suffer a side effect that interferes with the quality of life. Now, well, who's the best uh, person to answer that question? It's the patient. It's right, the patient okay, stay me. there, because yeah. I just want yeah. to run, th- I've, got, I've got somebody to put the other side of it. Sure. Without having an an argy bargy argy bargy, but we, so, so, no, in a second, in a second, I've got okay. somebody to put the other side. Um, so you're talking about an epidemic epidemic of misinformed doctors, biased reporting, people with a, an interest in profit. Uh, what else did you say? Um, Inability of doctors and patients to well doctors to, to communicate and understand health statistics and risk. Uh, and to, 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 uh, wait, 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 wait. Health statistics and risk, and uh, also with people with side effects taken out of the trial before it begins. Let's put those points to Professor Rory Collins, who was on earlier on, is now in the studio. Good morning again. Good morning, Nick. You're a great advocate of statins. No, I'm a great advocate for information being reliable and provided to patients. And is doctors. it reliable? This information. Yes, it is. I think there, the, part of the problem is how one interprets evidence. And there are two main sources of evidence. There are what some people call real-world evidence, where you compare the um, uh, symptoms that people report when they're being given a statin versus people who haven't been given a statin. But by the way, you're one of the report's authors, just to clarify. Yeah. Carry on. Now, the problem with such studies is that we do know that statins can rarely cause a muscle problem. Um, And so when doctors give patients the drugs, they have to advise them of that. Um, And therefore, they're sensitized to uh, reporting muscle problems to their doctors. When you compare that with people who haven't been given the drug in the so-called real world, uh, they haven't been sensitized in that way. So it's quite understandable that many more people who are taking the drug will report the muscle problem. Are you getting any money at all from the pharmaceutical industry? We get funding from the pharmaceutical industry to do research, which is run independently uh, through Oxford University. We hold the data, we analyze the data, we interpret the data. Are people with side effects taken out of this trial, any trial before it begins? Almost all of the randomized trials um, 
randomized people who were at high risk of heart disease in about half of the large-scale trials. So are people with side effects taken out of the, any trial before it begins? In about half of the trials, they used a dummy tablet for the run-in. Uh, so people weren't taking the drug before they uh, started to go into the trial. What that does actually is increase the ability to pick up any side effects because you withdraw the people who are not going to take the tablets. And in those randomized trials, there was no excess of muscle symptoms among people taking the active drug versus the dummy drug. So wow. the comment about run-in is actually a bit of a misunderstanding in that it in actually increases the ability to detect effects. Great response then uh, from uh, your good self, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Malhotra. Well, no, I mean, I think that ultimately, uh, and I agree with Professor Collins, what we need to have is, you know, reliable, independent information so we can make decisions and patients can make decisions when, whether or not to take a statin. And I have no doubt that statins have a benefit. The question is what those true benefits are and what are the likelihood of harms and then how do we translate for patients to make informed decisions. Now, one of the issues is, and Professor Collins knows this very well and I have a great respect for his work, is that, you know, the, the Oxford trialists, you know, they have received hundreds of millions in research funding for their institutions uh, over the years for these statin trials. And they hold on to that raw data. Now, it may be Professor Collins... It isn't within his remit to release that because I know there's commercial confidentiality. But one of the, the question marks raised by several people around the world, including editor of the BMJ, editor of Rita Redberg of John Internal Medicine, is we have no access to that raw data for independent scrutiny. And therefore, we cannot truly determine the actual true benefits and the harms. And there are other people around the world that have questioned what the true benefits are. Certainly, and Professor Collins will not disagree with me on this, um, is that if you're at low risk of heart disease, so less than 20% risk of developing cardiovascular disease in 10 years, you are not going to live one day longer. Now, there may be other benefits, such as preventing a non-fatal heart attack or stroke, uh, which, you know, may, which for patients could be important. But a lot of patients want to know how much longer they're going to live. Now, if you're looking at a healthy population, then that is not going to give them any mortality benefit. So, you know, there's a lot. It also depends on the individual risk. And what we need to do is have reliable information so we can assess for individuals the best course of action based upon their absolute risk reduction, how much benefit are they going to get, you know, whether it's one in 100 or one in 50, and what are the potential harms. Now, I do agree, and I see that in my own clinical practice, that although the side effects are much mm -hmm. more common than what are reported in the original trials, and we see that on a day-to-day -day basis, in most cases, they are reversible on either stopping the statin or reducing the dose, and that's what I do all the time. Thank you. Yeah.